So welcome back to Japan Business Time with Rochelle Karp for the Rewa edition and uh, as part of Rewa, a time of transformation yes, and, and change and blossoming, and blossoming, blossoming right? and, yes. uh, the metamorphosis of companies into the new economy. Uh, we had a great question from Quint Rankid which is uh, how do companies in Japan uh, cope with transforming their businesses that so many companies right. are doing right now? Great question. Uh, so yeah, let's find out what Rochelle has to say. So this is a big theme and there are some really prominent examples, I think particularly in international companies mm -hmm. that have imposed demands for change and transformation in Japan right. that at the best of times would be challenging. Right, and change is not easy in Japan, right? Right. So, yeah, what are some good examples and, and what do you think are some examples of a good way to manage a big sort of change of business focus and, and what are some bad ways that you can think of? Mm, well, it's particularly tricky in Japan because... A lot of times in the U.S. when you're making a big change, mm. you just let a lot of people go and you hire a lot of new people. And that's just not something that companies do in Japan, right? right. So that kind of easy way out is not available. Mm. And so you have to get people on board with a new way of doing things. Right. Which is not so Getting by straightforward, any. right? Exactly. Yeah. On that, it, instead of laying off workforces, so many Japanese companies have these enormous workforces mm. that uh, are no longer in profitable areas of the company right and being unable based on japan labor laws to dismiss them um they have they do things like they set up joint ventures with other companies and right. they try to move the employees yeah and i see a lot of loose. that joint venture and then so oh you're in the joint venture and all of a sudden somehow you're going to stay there there's a lot of that there's a lot of setting up just completely unrelated businesses so yeah. the steel company that has builds the amusement park or the electronics company that has a fish farm yeah right um, yeah, there was, there's a bunch of fa factories now that they're growing um, food inside the factories with hydroponics. Wow. But I'm sure they're using the same employees for that, right? I remember with Olympus as well, they had like their imaging business. Part of what came out was all their investments in like, uh, you know, cosmetics and uh, all sorts you know, of weird health stuff. food. Yeah. And yeah. It was, uh, and those businesses were all sort of failing. And it wasn't really clear why they were doing it either. Right. So, so you know, the, the whole idea of a diversifying can mm. be misused. Yeah. Right. I think a good example of a big transformation in recent history that was controversial would perhaps be the transformation of Nissan. Ah, well, that's a whole <laughs> other topic, right? Well, there, there's many ways to go on that, but just on the transformation itself, yeah. by some measures it was seen as successful, but at the same time it was, uh, it, 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 it certainly did rock the boat. And go. this is going back 20 years. This is going back to when Nissan was about right, right. to collapse. It was about to collapse, but he did things like close a factory, and that's a big deal in Japan, right? Yes, that's right. Well, Especially at that time. Yeah people weren't changing that much. I mean, and now things are a little bit different. It's a little bit easier, but yeah. 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 The other big thing about that transformation at Nissan, and actually Sony followed, I think, did the same thing soon after, transforming the supply chain practices. Mm. Um, the idea that these companies had thousands of suppliers that basically only served like one, one company that they supplied and there was all these, right. you know, it, it was unmanageable and from a procurement perspective, it wasn't efficient. So when you had these global efficiency experts come and say, why are you procuring you know, 10 different widgets, you know, the same widget from 10 different family companies? Right, right. Why not get them from one big Chinese company that will give them to you cheaper right. and purchase in bulk? Um, but disturbing those uh, supply chains was uh, on a society hard. level was very tough. Wasn't very it? hard, yes, exactly, yeah. So, but sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes it's just, you know, the company doesn't want to make fax machines anymore and they want to move, that. they want to upgrade to whatever the next <laughs> big technology was after that that Japan still hasn't adopted yet. Mm -hmm. So what do, how do Japanese companies manage these transformations? Um, it's very difficult. And one thing that I found is that, you know, there's a whole discipline in the United States of change management. Yeah. And it doesn't really exist in Japan. Right. And there isn't really even a great word for it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's just not a thing that, that happens. And so, so many times what I see in big Japanese companies is the, the executives, you know, the CEO or whatever, they, they seem to think that they have a magic wand. And they, yeah. they spout a bunch of buzzwords. They tell everyone we're going to change. Yeah. And then the middle management doesn't change at all. Yeah. I see a lot of that happening. And then the people at the lower levels are like, oh, we really like what the top people are saying, but nothing's going to change anyways. The other thing I must admit, thinking back, uh, that I've seen is uh, M&A. We said this at the beginning as well, but M&A is used partly because it's hard to move people. 
But this idea, for example, you have these, uh, when the display makers were failing because of Korean and Chinese competition, right. they all banded together to spin out the display manufacturing yeah, sure, into another and thing. create yes. Japan display. Exactly. Which seemed to be a competitively good good idea at the time as well, although it's uh -huh. also had its ups and downs since that started. Right, right, exactly. Uh, silicon wafer manufacturing as well. Some of the right, big right. competing silicon wafer manufacturers, again in the face of competition, for, okay. formed these big joint companies. Right. And it wasn't necessarily a cynical ploy. Uh, it was trying to create new scale or whatever. Exactly, yeah. But, but then you have all these companies that are, then there are amalgams of, you know, three different semiconductor firms of their own kind, you know, cultures yeah. come together, and that's not so easy either, right? But what about as well, the other thing that's really happening in Rewa, since they were staying on the theme, uh, is uh, these huge IT transformations. And so many companies, particularly like banks, for example, have uh -huh. these huge IT workforces based on looking after the old machines and whatever, and right. particularly global companies. Um, you know, they want their sales force implemented right, and whatever, right, right. and it requires different skills. Um, it's very hard. And how, I feel how do you manage that? It's a really big problem in Japan because the problem is, is that there's not enough IT engineers. Mm. And a really big proportion of IT, IT engineers, they're doing maintenance on 20 to 30 year old systems. Mm. So they're not learning the new skills. Right. And they're miserable. Because if you're an <laughs> IT engineer and you want to do the cutting edge stuff and you're working on a 30 year old system, that's deadly, right? Yeah. It's a huge problem. So, you know, if you're an international company and you want to get everybody from using a mainframe to using a, a cloud-based thing like Salesforce, for example, yeah. um, and you've got to, okay, s send you over to Japan, retrain the local workforce, or, you know, replace the people who don't want to learn and hire some new people. It's not so easy, easy here. It's not so easy here. That's the problem. Because yeah. you can't replace people that easily. Yeah. And also, people don't necessarily have a great eagerness to do new things. If what they've been doing before works well, yeah. and they're kind of emotionally invested in it, right? Yeah. And fear of the new is also a thing as well. Huge. I mean, Japanese are not first movers generally. Uh, they will look until an example has right. been proven by somebody else. Uh, but even when it happens, you know, the vested mm -hmm. interest in uh, you know, putting off change and coming up with excuses for not doing it are always a, a, a big thing. Right, right. Well, exactly. Well, the thing is, Japan is a, if it's not broken, don't fix it country. Yeah. And, hey, that mainframe has been working fine for the last 30 years. Why do we need to change it? It's well, very hard to argue with that, right? Well, you look at the banks and some government ministries as well, and it can be broken, and they can still say don't fix it. <laughs> That's true, too. Um, but, you know, because people are invested. Yeah. Because maybe the guy who's the bucho now, it yeah. was his idea to create it 20 years ago. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's a big challenge doing it. Mm -hmm. What does it take to make it work? You have to have someone at the top who really wants it to happen. Okay. And that's where we go back to the whole Nissan thing. Yeah. Because Carlos Ghosn was able to come in there and say, this is my priority, I'm making it happen. You have yeah. to have top leadership for these things. Mm. Certainly, yeah. I, I can think of uh, Mitsubishi UFG is another example mm -hmm. where they got a new CIO who said, oh, everybody stop putting this off, we're doing right, this, right. And, and they're doing these big transformations, but they did come from the top. But there again, Japan isn't really a, necessarily a, a, just because the boss says that it happens country. Well, that's a problem too, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the boss has to show that he's serious, and then if you don't go along with it, that there will be repercussions, right? And that's not something that traditionally <laughs> Japanese bosses did, so yeah. it's a new thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and certainly the, the... Yeah, and this is another theme which I want to come to in a different episode if we get to it, about uh, something that Gon raised actually in his... Um, video that he left behind where he sort of defended his uh, approach of being a strong leader and uh, disagreeing with the Japanese managers who were undermining him who favored a consensus based approach. Mm -hmm. I always tell people don't expect you're going to be able to implement your program unless you get buy-in and consensus for it in Japan. Right. Um, but it's a fine balance because consensus is also used by people who want to avoid transformation and Right, change. and just slow things down, right? Yeah, yes, or, to, exactly. or to totally sabotage actually as well. Yeah. So um, there, there's a tension there, especially for expat managers who are often sent to Japan with a program, you know, with, right. with something to achieve. Right. So there's all sorts of great, it's a great topic, there's all sorts of uh, ways that we can explore this that we will continue to explore during the Reiwa edition exactly. of Japan Business Time. Thank you. So yeah, join us next week.